Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Jayla Tyler. Thank you so much for joining us today um, at our uh, 2021 webinar, Changing Climate Series. We're very excited to have uh, our students come and speak today on incorporating climate into medical education. And we're happy that they've set aside time from their days. Uh, I'm just reminding everyone that all participants are in listen-only mode, but you can submit your questions through the Zoom menu throughout the presentation today. Questions will be taken at the very end. Um, and uh, we will be giving you instructions for CME credits um, at the end of the presentation. I would like to now uh, pass the, uh, the presentation or a webinar over to Dr. Nick Snow uh, to say a few words before we get started today. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I am Dr. Nick Snow, as she said. I'm uh, on the co-education chair with Homan of the Education Committee, and we're very happy to see you all. Um, we're members of Virginia Clinicians for Climate Action, uh, and I get the pleasure today of introducing our speakers who are students uh, at universities throughout the area. Um, and we'll talk about the progress they've made in terms of climate and health education at their universities. Um, the first speaker will be Isabel Contreras. She's a second year physician assistant student at Shenandoah University in Winchester, Virginia. She is a class of 20. 22 vice president co or acting vice president and co-chair of social media uh, at her university and she will speak to you the progress made at Shenandoah. So Isabel, um, start sharing your screen and we look forward to your presentation. Alrighty, I believe everybody can see my screen. I'm just gonna go ahead and hop into presenter mode. Um, so I just have a quick little non-disclosure slide. Um, I'm just gonna go ahead and move right on in. Um, so like Dr. Snow said, my name is Isabel Contreras and I go to Shenandoah University um, to their Master's of Physician Assistant Studies program. We're out in Winchester, Virginia. Um, and I just have a couple objectives for today's um, topic of conversation. Um, you guys can breeze through those quickly on your own. And I just kind of want to dive right in. So to just kind of talk a little bit about my background, um, as Dr. Snow said, I'm a physician assistant student. I received my undergrad degree from Christopher Newport in a focus in neuroscience. And I started in July of last year, right in the height of lockdown, actually. So I started PA school completely online, and that did actually really impact how I started my magical education. Um, I dived quickly into opportunities to get involved as best as I could in the online world. And that led to me applying to a fellowship two months into a graduate level program. The PAEA is the Physician Assistant Education Association. They're one of our national constituent organizations in the profession. And I was lucky enough to be one of 20 students selected throughout the country to join a committee and complete a conference in leadership advocacy and have the opportunity to speak to political leaders um, local to my region about topics that we felt were important to be discussing. So after having that experience, I realized that I fell in love with advocacy and I wanted to find um, a little bit more passion in education and getting the word out about opportunities for involvement throughout my program and just healthcare profession education across the state. And from there, I was actually connected to Dr. Snow. So I was able to talk to him very quickly about um, opportunities that I could get involved in as a student. And he really empowered me to take control of my own education and challenge this, the quote unquote academic, you know, logistical system and advocate for what I wanted to be taught about. And I felt very passionate about being educated about climate change. So I began, just through word of mouth, talking to students, professors, and eventually the Dean of our university's health professions about opportunities that I could improve that in our university. Um, my program has several core values and you can kind of see them right there, but we really wanted to have the opportunity to improve our current system about education. 
there was a lack of climate change education and conversations about the impacts that that might have on us and even more so the opportunities that we as students had to get involved right now as students. I think a lot of us felt that we are quote unquote baby PAs. We don't really have the opportunity to have those conversations with the big players yet. And that's simply not true. Um, you know, we really wanted to spread the word amongst each other and with our university that we were ready now, even if we didn't have all the facts or the statistics at our fingertips, we had the, you know, the drive and the ambition to make sure that we got the information we needed because the passion was there. Um, and thankfully, I go to a university that's very, very excellent in, um, you know, in encouraging us to take these opportunities. They're very supportive and open. And going to a private institution really opened a lot of doors for us. Um, we actually were able to communicate with students from the UVA Medical School. And with their information that we had, you guys are going to hear from them later, um, we used uh, this kind of spinning wheel to formulate a syllabus that we proposed um, to the dean who I mentioned that I spoke to. And from there, this was kind of our course structure. We spent about a week on each of these areas, and then additional information was provided on um, extra areas that we really felt passionate about, one being mental health. Um, so with this, I proposed a syllabus. The dean said, Shenandoah University has the unique opportunity to push through any elective one time without jumping through logistical hoops. So we had the chance to do a course somewhat spur of the moment. So within about a two month turnaround, we had a course ready to go. Um, we had Dr. Snow as our main instructor with assistance from that Dean. She served as a co-instructor as well. And we used this textbook called Environmetics. And then we use that wheel to create a topic structure for every single week. And then we essentially just did discussion boards. So we'd come to class prepared with doing some extra information and research on our own. We'd come in, listen to a guest lecturer for the first half of our course. And then the second half would be um, class discussion and more lectures about that topic of the week. And we actually decided as a course that we wanted to have the opportunity to do a couple projects on our own and kind of feed our own thirst for knowledge and curiosity. So we actually had the chance to design um, essentially cases, uh, clinical cases, where we might hypothetically see uh, you know, a patient or a patient's family member or a challenging situation we might encounter in the clinical world, and then talk through some of those challenges together, brainstorm and collaborate about that information. And that really turned out to be one of the best parts about the course. Um, as you can see, we had a lot of guest speakers from pediatricians, allergists, congressional representatives, um, environmental advocates across the, um, the state, and even psychologists. Um, we were able to do this all kind of because we were on Zoom. So in a way, while there were a lot of barriers, we kind of used them to our advantage. And we were able to communicate with people that we would have never been able to have guest lecture in the past. Um, and I think that's been one of the greatest opportunities we've gotten from this experience. Um, as you can kind of see, we took lots of screenshots from our Zoom calls throughout the summer. And we really became a close-knit group of students. We pushed each other to kind of get more information about things that we were curious about. And we challenged the status quo in a way of what medical education is, which goes much beyond treating a symptom. Um, I think a lot of times we go to treat a symptom or a disease state, and we don't really look much further beyond that. So we really dug into the social determinants of health, how we can change those, how we even have a conversation about climate change with a patient. Um, you know, so we really had the opportunity to capitalize on those things throughout the past summer. And in the future, I think that we are going to be continuing that lecture. Um, we're gonna be doing the course again. We're jumping through the logistical hoops, we're making it happen. And we're getting the word out there to include all graduate level health professions at my program. So that's going to include our nursing program, medical, um, sorry, music therapy, athletic training, physical therapy, occupational therapy, and the physician assistant program at my university. Um, again, we're doing this by word of mouth. We're just going to start talking about it more. We have the opportunity to send emails in our weekly newsletter. We have the opportunity to have um, documentaries presented at our university. So 
that's kind of how it started. And I think that's how it's gonna to continue to grow moving forward. Um, and I also just kind of wanted to leave you guys with a little quote. Um, this is from a PA out in Georgia and he goes to, he works at Emory University. Um, PA programs have a responsibility to teach about these consequential aspects of health um, impacts of climate in their curricula to meet the demand of the interest, passion and fury over the environmental challenges baked into our future. I think that in the new world of the pandemic, we've had the opportunity to see everyone find within themselves the courage to speak up and fight for what they really are um, you know, feeling is not being heard or discussed or talked about enough. And even more so health profession students have become ambassadors in the public sphere. And we are in charge of our own education as students. And so we've had the opportunity to be encouraged and discuss how we can capitalize on that right here in our own communities. And that's had echoing impacts across the state. That one conversation with Jennifer Wexton about how to advocate to somebody, it's allowed us to then send several letters out. We've had extra meetings. Um, people have continued having these conversations. And now we have a course that's continuing to grow and flourish and that we will see continuing for hopefully years to come. So there's a bit of a beauty in empowering students to take control of their own education and fight for what they actually want to see. And we have seen great success with it. So I'm looking forward to seeing what we do uh, moving forward. And I think that should be it for me. I think I'm ready to actually pass it on to Savita. Uh, thank you for that excellent presentation. And Isabel, personally, thank you for allowing me to teach this course. It was one of the joys of my life. So um, now I get to introduce Savita Patarazu. Um, she is a third year medical student at George Washington University School of Medicine and Health Sciences. She is current co-chair of the Climate Smart Healthcare for Medical Students for a Sustainable Future. Um, and she will speak at, at, at what she's been able to accomplish so far. So go ahead, Savita. Thank you, everybody. Um, so, again, starting with the disclosure slide, I have no financial interest or relationships to disclose. Um, and yes, my name is Savita. I'm a third year medical student, like Dr. Snow said. And today I'll be talking about um, promoting the topic of eco medical literacy and the MD program at GW, and eventually how that will extend to other health professions programs at our medical school. Um, these are some objectives that will kind of outline my presentation. I'll define eco-medical literacy since um, it's a fairly new field. I'll talk about how we integrated um, principles of eco-medical literacy in our recommendations at school and um, both in the preclinical and clerkship years. Um, just a little bit of background about myself. Um, I received a Bachelor of Arts in Social Determinants of Health at George Washington University. Um, I also pursued my senior thesis on this topic while I was studying abroad in Switzerland. Um, so my passion for the, the topic of um, climate change and how it impacts human health goes a couple of years back. And um, I really appreciate how much traction it has gained uh, in the last couple of years as well. Um, I'm also in, so I'm in like a dual degree program at GW, so I hope to extend my interest um, in clinical public health uh, by pursuing my master's after I finish my core rotation next April and finish step two. Um, and like Dr. Snow mentioned, I'm current co-chair uh, for MS4SF in Climate Smart Healthcare and recently decided I'm likely an aspiring pediatrician, so thought I'd throw that in there as well. So eco-medical literacy, is the ability to access, understand, integrate, and use the information about the health-related ecological effects of climate change to deliver and improve medical services. Um, while that sounds like a mouthful, in essence, it's, a basic, it's basically um, understanding the ways that climate change influences human health on an individual level, at the community level, at a population level, um, and how that will guide our clinical decision-making as providers. And using this framework, um, 
we first used MS Borisov's planetary health report card to conduct a needs assessment about where our um, curriculum was at the time. So in the summer of 2020, the height of the pandemic, uh, we students were looking for things to do. Um, so a couple of my colleagues and I got together and we took a look at our preclinical curriculum first. So we compiled all of our learning objectives for all of our organ system blocks, our clinical public health courses and our practice of medicine course. Um, and we did, we used like an algorithmic search to figure out um, whether planetary health related topics are represented in our curriculum. And if any of you have questions about how we did that, I'm happy to go more in detail. Um, but in essence, we figured out that there are gaps everywhere in our curriculum. We, there are some learning objectives that merely just mention the word environment. We found that to be too broad, like in addressing environmental determinants of health as an example. And we thought that um, some of our objectives could be made um, more tailored to our current climate crisis since it is such a huge health threat across the globe. Um, so we did a literature search for ecomedical literacy related competencies and happened upon um, one or two papers in particular. One was published in August of last year, which was timely, that goes through uh, different organ systems and specific learning objectives within those organ systems relating to how um, climate change influences health in that way. And I will give you some examples in the following slide. In the spring of this year, after we compiled um, the competencies and made some recommendations, we reached out to some of our advisors uh, who have been supervising us on this project and got our foot in the door um, to some meetings with deans and faculty um, who were really receptive to our recommendations because we provided such a structured way to longitudinally infuse this into our existing curriculum instead of adding uh, significant curriculum time, which was one of the major appeals of uh, the work in addition to the urgency of the situation. Um, currently, we've been circulating our recommendations to different committees at GDP. So we have um, a theme subcommittee that is responsible for all the various themes within our four-year MD program. Um, some of them are related to racial justice, some of them are related to human behavioral and development. And what we're kind of figuring out right now is whether we want to create a separate theme for climate change and health in our curriculum to um, round all of our recommendations out. Um, and so because so much of our focus has been on the preclinical side of things, our next step is to focus on the clerkship uh, level recommendations and competencies since those aren't as well established uh, for that level of our training. So here are some examples of the EML competencies and these are sample slides that we provided to our deans and faculty. So on the left, you'll see um, we integrated, so we identified our current course objective, which is already in our syllabus. And this is for a Foundations of Medicine course, which is the beginning of our first year of medical school where we're just learning, you know, like biochemistry, genetics, all of like the fundamental things. Um, and so our current course objective for this was discuss the biological, psychological, social, environmental, cultural, and spiritual aspects of health um, and disease. And the corresponding EML session objective that we identified um, was outline a climate change environmental exposure pathway through which climate change affects human health or disrupts healthcare delivery. And because we wanted to set a foundation for like the rest of our longitudinal integration, we suggested that this be like a virtual or asynchronous lecture um, based on existing materials, such as those provided by the Planetary Health Alliance. So no new work required. Um, we have plenty of faculty at GW who are well versed in this topic and could easily give this uh, presentation as a foundational course. Um, another example would be in our cardiology, pulmonology, and renal block. Um, I won't read out the whole course objective here, but we just proposed adding the word environmental and then the corresponding EML session objective, which I should clarify session objectives are merely just for that specific lecture. And of course, objective is for um, that whole course, so like the block itself. Um, and then we proposed integrating it, or let me go back, um, describing how the kidneys respond to heat stress and maintain temperature and water homeostasis um, and what that means for renal function. So we provided the example 
example of an existing lecture we had on chronic kidney disease, cited some evidence to show that exposure to increased heat um, can have these effects on the kidney. And so we did that for all of our preclinical blogs. And these are just some examples of how we did that. Um, and we also have a course called Patients, Populations, and Systems, which is our clinical public health course. And we found related EML objectives here too, where we focus on um, the impacts of environmental, impacts on environmental justice of our current climate crisis. And um, this is one such example um, and how we recommend integrating it into an existing lecture we had. Again, citing evidence because this is all about following the science of climate change. So taking all of our recommendations and putting them together, we created this toolkit for our deans and faculty, which they really loved. And we had a meeting about this last Monday where we, my colleagues and I put together this PDF document um, outlining for each organ system, each course um, in our preclinical curriculum, exactly how we recommend taking our course objectives, um, integrating the corresponding EML session objectives and how exactly it can be implemented as well as supporting evidence to do that. Um, I'm happy to send this document to anybody who's interested. I think it would be really helpful um, to kind of create this framework for Dean faculty. I found that they've been really receptive to this because we students do a lot of the heavy lifting and at the end of the meetings, they're like, so what are our next steps? You just did everything for us. Um, and I'm also happy to talk more in the Q&A about how this went. The other exciting thing was that one of our deans asked the students to come up with MD program objectives to create um, kind of an umbrella under which our longitudinal curriculum would fall. So we also sat down and provided some examples of how um, climate and health could be manifested as MD program objectives, which are available on our website to people applying into the MD program or their health professions. And so these are kind of in the works right now. These are really just draft ideas that we presented to the, um, our deans and faculty last Monday, and we are currently tweaking um, and adjusting. And of course, I have to go through a whole approval process, but the fact that they want this information to be part of our MD program at this level really was such a win for us. And this is just food for thought, nothing we have to talk about right now, but um, something that we're working on and something I could also use some help with is thinking of clerkship level competencies, which um, we feel like we might have to create from scratch since it's not widely available in the literature or there might be some existing at other institutions, which is why this form is so great. Um, but these are two that we've come up with so far just to give you a sense of what this would look like. So earlier in the presentation, I kind of talked about how um, we would outline the climate change exposure pathway in our foundations course and in the, at the clerkship level kind of bring that into consideration when you're developing an overall assessment of a patient about why they came in, why they're sick, and um, really delving into the determinants of health that um, they may be experiencing. Another example would be applying principles of disaster preparedness for extreme weather events um, to the anticipatory guidance we may provide our patients to make sure that they feel safe and prepared in the event of a flood or a fire or a, or a storm um, and make sure that they have the medical equipment and tools to stay safe and healthy. Um, so that's just food for thought. I'm happy to answer questions or open it up for discussion session at the end. Um, there's my email if you're interested in chatting more and I will pass it on to the next speaker. Thank you for having me. Again, Savita, an excellent presentation. And again, it shows the power of what students can do. I just can't believe remembering my years as a medical student that you had enough time, all of you to, to put all this together. So I really appreciate it and really appreciate the passion that goes behind it. So thank you. Um, it's my pleasure now to introduce the third and final group. They're gonna be a group speaking. These are the student clinicians for climate action at University of Virginia. And this is an interdisciplinary chapter of medical students for a sustainable future. And that, um, that's a network of medical students in the United States who recognize that climate change is an urgent threat to health and social justice. And uh, they will introduce themselves individually as, as uh, we proceed. So take it away.
All righty. So thank you so much for that brief introduction. Um, can everyone see my screen all right? Great. Um, my name is Lena Bichelle. I'm a third year medical student at UVA. Um, and along with my colleagues, Venkat, Kylie, and Reichel, or, wow, and Leah, excuse me, um, we'll be talking a little bit about who we are, how we started, what we've done, and where we're going. Um, so first, we don't have any financial disclosures or conflicts of interest to uh, disclose at this time. Um, our group uh, at UVA, um, which is the Student Clinicians for Climate Action at UVA, has over 60 members. Um, the, this slide here shows the 10 uh, medical students who worked on the Planetary Health Report Card and who are kind of the core leadership group of our, of our, of our club. Um, and here are the four of us, oops, excuse me, who will be presenting to you today. So now you'll see our faces. Um, so how did we all start? Um, it all began over the 2020 to 2021 summer, uh, which you might have heard in previous presentations. It was a time where many of us were dealing with existential dread and sitting around with a lot of nothing to do. Um, I was fortunate enough at that time to have the support and mentorship as a Hook Scholar through our Center for Health, Humanities, and Ethics to address some of that dread um, through my summer project. So um, my summer project uh, aimed to examine the role of the environment, particularly a changing climate on human health and healthcare. Um, to do so, I used what I deemed a multi-prong approach um, that included weekly discussions on climate change, race, and health um, based around a widespread literature re uh, review, including art, uh, creative writing, and academic literature. Um, additionally, we connected and consulted with local, regional, and national leaders in the climate change-minded clinical care, including VCCA. Um, we, I planned and arranged a panel discussion with subject experts to off, uh, that was offered as a medical center hour here at UVA uh, in the fall of 2020. Um, and we collaborated, or I aimed to collaborate with student groups uh, interested in climate change and health at other regional institutions. And then finally, uh, I wanted to explore how to incorporate all of these concepts into our learning materials for our preclinical curriculum. Uh, more broadly speaking, my pro summer project, and this was all within, you know, two months, uh, aimed to um, increase current and future UVA School of Medicine students' awareness of the evolving impact of climate change on human health and clinical care. Oopsie. Um, so one of those objectives, as you might have uh, recall, was starting a student group to get um, UVA students engaged. Uh, which I did in, in the fall of 2020 and luckily had a lot of buy-in from my uh, classmates and colleagues. Um, we founded the Student Clinicians for Climate Action at UVA. Um, since becoming a, uh, since the, over the 12 months since becoming an active student group and chapter of Medical Students for a Sustainable Future, we expanded beyond the walls of the School of Medicine to include other health professional students um, and, uh, and, and, people across the university community. Um, we now number over 60 members. Um, and one of our major activities that we completed over the last 12 months uh, was the Planetary Health Report Card, which now Venkat will discuss further. So uh, like Lena said, I'm gonna be talking about the Planetary Health Report Card. So before we talk about that, I wanna quickly define Planetary Health. So the Planetary Health Alliance defines Planetary Health as a field focused on characterizing the human health impacts of human-caused disruptions of Earth's natural systems. Now, this definition is pretty broad, and that's intentional because there are many ways that the environment can affect human health, including water scarcity, urbanization, natural disasters, climate change, global pollution, things like that. And so it's obvious that the health of humanity is dependent on the environment in which we live in, and our environment is changing rapidly and in rather disastrous ways. And although the World Health Organization has called climate change the greatest threat to global health in the 21st century, many medical schools institution priorities do not reflect the urgency of this danger. And so this is where the PHRC or the Planetary Health Report Card comes in. And it was created so that medical students internationally can grade their home institutions in terms of the integration of planet health awareness. And so this is a medical good excuse me, a medical student driven initiative that compares medical schools to five main categories. So one, planetary health curriculum, two, interdisciplinary research in health and environment, 
Three, university support for student planetary health initiatives. Four, community outreach centered on environmental health impacts. And finally, five, medical school campus sustainability. And so over the past academic year, over 60 of these report cards were completed for over 60 medical schools in the US, the UK, and Ireland. And so uh, how do we go about actually using this report card? So there are five sections, and each section has about 60, uh, six to 20 questions per section that would guide our assessment. And so um, there will be detailed criteria for scoring in each question. And the way we would get that information is we would look at learning objectives and existing learning resources. So each lecture in our preclinical curriculum has learning objectives. And so we'd go back and look at those. We would also reach out to faculty, staff, administrators, even other students, as well as clerkship directors, elective directors, research faculty, and the broader university faculty as well. And so we review all those resources and compile information based on the specific question for that section. And so here's an example of one of those questions. And we would basically answer this one by emailing administrators, medical school, student council members, and looking through resources available to us as students. And then we would score it based on the information we found and then give an explanation. And then that would be compiled and we would get a result uh, or a grade. And so now I'll pass the baton on to my colleague, Kylie. Hi. Um, so yeah, we completed the planetary health report card following the process that Venkat described. Um, and you can see the UVA School of Medicine on the map here. Um, we ended up with the grade of a C, which was about average among participating schools. Um, and so overall, we did pretty well in three out of the five metrics. We had a score of a B minus in interdisciplinary research in health and the environment and to be in support for student-led initiatives and sustainability. Um, and through this process, we identified two major areas for improvement, planetary health curriculum and community outreach and advocacy. So with respect to the planetary health curriculum, at the time of our report card, there was a single optional lecture focused on the impact of climate change on health, sparse learning objectives on the topic, few if any test questions and no existing fourth year elective. Um, and we found our greatest strengths to be in both student and faculty enthusiasm towards um, working towards bettering our performance in this area. Um, and then pertaining to community outreach and advocacy, we found that UVA School of Medicine contributed to the generation of green communal spaces through a formal relationship with the Charlottesville City School Yard Garden as a part of our social issues in medicine course or SIM program, um, which is great. However, at the time of our report card, no organization at UVA offered any community-focused courses or events about climate change, um, and UVA students also were not found to receive any regular communication from the School of Medicine about planetary health. Um, so through this process, we identified our areas for improvement and um, specific goals, and Leah is going to talk a little bit more about our progress so far and ongoing projects. Yeah, so now I'm going to talk about a few of the project, projects that resulted from our completion of the PHRC. Um, one collaboration we're really excited about is a nursing planetary health report card. The nursing students were really interested in contributing to the report card, but unfortunately the current planetary health report card is specific to medical schools. So we met with the national creators of the PHRC along with our nursing colleagues and now they're currently creating their own nursing specific planetary health report card that will then hopefully become a model for other nursing schools around the world. Um, another exciting collaboration was the VCCA Climate and Health Summit, which was held in the spring of this year. Um, this summit allowed students in Virginia to talk about opportunities and challenges in incorporating climate health into the medical curriculum. Uh, the presentations at the summit provided us with a great framework to start our two main projects this year, which are the fourth year elective and uh, climate health fellows, which I'm going to talk a little bit more about. So in this slide, we've outlined our rough process of incorporating a climate health elective into medical curriculum. The first step was to identify and prove a need for the elective, which was done through the PHRC. This not only demonstrated UVA's need for more climate health in the, their curriculum, but 
It also gave us examples of what other schools were doing because we were able to look at their report cards for inspiration. The next step was research and collaboration. A lot of the collaboration was done through the VCCA summit, and a lot of the research was done through Lena's Hook Scholar project, which she described earlier. This step was really important to learn from others' mistakes and successes in their own process. Um, the research and collaboration emphasized to us the need to engage all the stakeholders who would be involved in this process. So for example, we identified passionate faculty sponsors who would continue on this climate health elective after we have graduated and gone to residency. Uh, we gained institutional support after discussing our ideas with our administration and incorporating their feedback and suggestions. We also gauged student interest by sending out a survey to see if and when students would be interested in taking a climate health elective. Uh, and after all this, we planned and presented our elective. And I'm very happy to say that after reading our proposal, the curriculum committee approved our elective, which will be taking place in late January of 2022. So now our next step is to implement the elective and evaluate for improvements for next year's class. So now I'm going to talk about learning objectives. Uh, for those who don't know, learning objectives are concise statements that define what students are expected to learn and will be tested on. So they're incredibly important in defining what students will learn and study in medical school. So one of our main goals is to have climate health learning objectives incorporated into the preclinical curriculum that all students will be exposed to. However, as this would be a required curriculum and not an opt-in curriculum like the fourth year elective, there are more aspects to consider. For example, a lot of people have influence and input into the learning objectives of the curriculum. So we spoke with the Dean of Curriculum this summer who was incredibly supportive and gave us great advice in creating the learning objectives. Um, we'll also have to present any learning objectives in, to the curriculum committee for approval before they're incorporated into the curriculum. We also need the input and advice of faculty advisors who have more experience in creating educational content than we do. Um, we'll need the input of system leaders who are in charge of large units of the curriculum, so like cardiac or uh, pulmonary units. And these system leaders can help us identify if and where content could be incorporated in a unit. Then we need input from individual lecturers about how and where to incorporate these materials into their presentation. And obviously we also need input of the students who will be learning the material. So once we have all this input, we need to create quite a bit of content for these learning objectives. Obviously we need to create the learning objectives themselves. As I've said previously, these statements need to be precise so students know what to study. We also need to identify a location in the curriculum for the content, including where in a specific presentation material would be presented. Then we need to create presentation slides you can see over on the bottom right an example slide that we're working on. Next, we need to provide presentation talking points for the speaker who will be teaching the slides. Um, and we obviously need to provide references and resources for the students. And lastly, we'll need to create test questions to actually test this content on student exams. So as you can see, there's a lot to consider and a lot of work that will go into creating these learning objectives. This is still a work in progress at UVA, but I'm happy to say we have a lot of support from different administrators and faculty, and I'm hopeful that we'll be able to incorporate some of these into our curriculum in the future. So thank you all for listening to our presentation and showing interest in climate health education, and we'd be happy to take any questions you might have. I just wanted to thank you all for speaking again. It's, uh, it's, it's wonderful to see all the energy and enthusiasm uh, and accomplishments that you guys have made so far at your different institutions in, in different ways. So that's, uh, that's exciting to see. Um, just uh, uh, Savita brought up sort of the um, thought of clerkships and I was just gonna um, ask, uh, if you could tell us more about that, because I think that's an interesting way to incorporate that. And have you at UVA thought of that as well? Yeah, I'm happy to speak to that. Um, it's interesting because I think if you were to look at the traction we've gained on the preclinical side of things versus clerkship, on the preclinical side, it's been a little more straightforward kind of 
going to the pathway that Leah was just talking about of like learning objective to content and all of the pieces that are required. And it, to a certain extent, it's like that at the clerkship level. I think some of the challenges that we face so far are um, time. <laughs> and while curriculum time in the preclinical drum has come up, but um, clerkship time ten seems to be a little more rigid in that at least at GW, clerkships have like a well-defined period of time. Some are four weeks, some are six weeks, some are eight weeks, and then they have students have shelf exams and it's really busy time. And figuring out where exactly this content can fit has been a challenge. Um, at GW, what we're kind of thinking about is we have intersession days um, sprinkled throughout our third and fourth years of medical school where we just have um, case discussions and lectures about hot topics in medicine. Um, and that would be a great place for this. And they already, those days and weeks already exist. Sometimes it's a week long of multiple different lectures. Sometimes it's just one day kind of interspersed throughout a clerkship. And the intersession directors have reached out to us students working on the climate and health work and they've they've identified spaces where they want to introduce this material. So that seems to be where we're gonna start with the clerkship years and that for learning objectives and intersession, they don't have to go through formal approval through committees, the intersection directors can approve them themselves and they seem willing to do that. So that seems like the next step for us. Um, I am on the path of challenging our clerkship directors to integrate objectives into the clerkship themselves over time. I understand it will, take time to kind of meticulously integrate them and what exactly that looks like on the wards. Um, we take standardized shelf exams, so it's not like we can integrate test questions necessarily into our, into our NBME shelf exams unless the NBME does it, um, which is ideal, but I think it will take a long, uh, longer time to get there. So intercession is where we're starting. I think at, um, at the level of integrating it into clerkship objectives, and what it looks like on the wards in my mind, um, having conversations about how patients' conditions are influenced by their environmental exposures is something that I hope would become more standard in our conversations. And um, as we're talking about differential diagnoses or why, um, or how people's like increased heat exposure is influencing their illness, um, and how that translates from learning objective to action is a little less concrete in the clerkship sphere. So I understand why there are some barriers um, to do that, but that's at least how I envision it. From the UVA side, um, we have not done a whole lot around incorporating it into clerkships beyond, um, you know, as individuals thinking about how we can, mention climate or exposures in our patient interactions. However, personally, uh, Leah and I are the two who are present who have done or are currently on uh, clerkships. And most rotations um, include a, like a presentation as part of that rotation. And so something that she and I have done um, is taking the opportunity every time or as when possible to use that presentation time to talk about how, um, you know, when I was in my surgery rotation, I did um, a presentation on the climate impact of the OR. Um, so it's further, it's, it's further educating the attendings and the residents and the other students who are present on um, how integrated planetary health is into everything that we're doing. Um, so far, every time I've done that, I've gotten really positive feedback and, you know, heard even more people coming out of the woodwork saying, oh, I've been working on this project doing X, Y, and Z related to this, you know, would love to get you involved. So every time that's happened, uh, from when we were doing the planetary health report card all the, all the way through these presentations on, on clerkships, um, people are so excited and so enthusiastic and so ready to help and excited to hear that there's, you know, like a moderately formal approach that we're trying to take to address some of these things. Well, thank you. And it's something that when we had PA students rotate through us in gastroenterology, they would do presentations. So I like that idea because it's universally it sounds universally applicable. So I'm gonna turn it over to Jayla now for the Q&A session. So thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all for Yes, thank you so much, everybody. Um, 
we're, we're really passionate about this and the fact that um, you guys as students are working to make a difference at that level, um, it's something that I know our organization views as necessary and pertinent to our mission. Um, so thank you so much for taking the time today to, um, to show the, the strides that have been done um, at the education level. Um, give me one moment, count. I apologize. Before we go ahead um, into official questions, I do want to go ahead and show um, a video that we have made as an organization um, to kind of show or uh, emphasize the need for clinicians and health professionals to be aware of the connection between climate and health. Uh, so I'll go ahead and show you guys the video that we have just released. Challenges is what we're trained to do in medicine. Implementing climate change solutions will protect our patients now and in the future. More air pollution worsens asthma. This particularly harms communities of color. That's why I support public transit that helps clean the air and protects my patients' lungs. Building walkways and bike lanes helps people stay active and healthy while protecting our climate. Heat waves are dangerous for people on some medications. That's why pharmacy students like me support clean energy solutions that help stop global warming. Hotter summers make it harder for kids to stay active and safe. Increasing community green space and shade helps my patients play safely outside. Urge your elected officials to support climate solutions. Together we can build a cleaner, safer, healthier future. We're ready. Let's do this. Oh. So it looks like from the chat, um, we did have one participant um, that did ask mm -hmm. a question, but go ahead, Jayla, if you want to. Yes. Um, so I wanted to make sure that you guys, after watching that video, um, if you would like to take action to show um, your local representatives and legislators that you support climate solutions, um, you can actually go here nope. and chat for everybody. And click that link to take action. I would also um, like to just briefly go over uh, the CME credits. Uh, if you would like to scan this QR code here, uh, you can get um, your CME credit or claim your CME credit. You'll also be emailed instructions after the webinar um, in order to, to get um, these more in-depth instructions on, on how to take those steps. And feel free to check out our other recorded webinars we've done in the past. And with that being said, I know we do have a, a question in the chat. So um, if you guys would like to move into questions, um, we can go ahead and do that. I know Chip uh, Goya did ask, um, the report cards are great. Did you share with the Dean in leadership and are they published online? I can uh, speak to that about around UVA. So all of the report cards, um, are published online on the Planetary Health Report Card website. I think you can, I can track down the link or maybe one of my colleagues can do that and drop it in the chat while I'm talking. So um, you can access them. And the great thing about the Planetary Health Report Card is it's this longitudinal um, assessment. Um, so we'll be doing it again this year. And in doing it longitudinally, we get to see how things improve, where things improve and continue to refocus in the areas of greatest need while comparing ourselves to all the other institutions who participate. Um, yeah, so Kylie shared that link. Um, you can see um, UVA's, GW's, all of the planetary health report cards that are there. Um, in terms of sharing it with the administrators, we did have, uh, much like everything else over the past 18 months, a Zoom presentation on our process and our findings. Um, most of the deans um, those who, you know, a few couldn't come, but most of our administrators came, were extremely receptive. And since then we've had, um, you know, further discussions with them around all these curricular changes um, and, and other changes that we're hoping to implement. So um, yes, we did share with the administrators and they were on board. 
Yeah, I'd also like to add something that was particularly effective about sharing the planetary report card with them was that they like to see where we stand among our peer institutions. And they, I think that's something that caught their attention because when we first presented to our deans in April of this year, that's one of the, the first things that we put on our slides was, you know, this is, we got like a B minus um, overall. And a lot of other great institutions were on there. And we, GW did the first round of the Planetary Health Report Card this year. There was um, increased turnout in terms of who, uh, the institutions that completed it. Um, and I think every year as time goes on, there'll be a much better pool of data to show where um, medical schools stand with this. And whether that was in the beginning or whether it's, you know, schools are completing it next year, the year after, deans are going to find it helpful to know that people are working on this, people are passionate about this, and people take are taking action on this. And this kind of relates to another question that was asked in the chat about whether this information is reflected on shelf exams or NBMEs or step exams. Um, it looks like we're heading in that direction. I don't know how long it'll take to get there, but I think the more traction this gains from the bottom up, eventually the ACGME will, fingers crossed, have learned like objectives for us to meet. Um, and we this will hopefully be testable material then. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, I know, uh, let's see, we have another question um, from Dr. Adut. Um, is anyone aware of progress to include climate and health on shelf or board exams? Yeah, so Savita kind of addressed that a little bit, but um, I'll, I'll add, um, you know, there are test writers, test question writers who might be among our, our attendees right now. So if you are in that position and have that power, please consider doing so. Because as students, we don't really have at this point a huge amount of input on what, what test questions we have other than expressing our desire to learn these things. But um, people who are further along in their career actually have the ability to shape what is on the tests. Yeah, and I'll add to that as a faculty that, you know, we even have some limited you know, control because a lot of it comes down from national guidelines and um, curriculum um, that were done within organizations. So, you know, for example, for internal medicine, there's clerkship director of internal medicine and similar groups in pediatrics and surgeries, et, et cetera, and that blueprints or curriculum um, really um, served as a way for um, test questions to be written. So absolutely, that is going to be the trend in the future where um, the, the you know, top-down um, dissemination of the information that's going to be driven um, as traction gets, um, you know, gets in place. But the bottom-up approach that you guys are spearheading right now is absolutely essential for that. Thank you. Um, I, I agree with that sentiment. I think um, the work that you as students are doing um, on the education levels is very important. And um, I'm thrilled to hear the progress that has been made <laughs> with all of you. Um, I know we do have two more questions, um, both of them being from um, Mr. Jerome Paulson. Um, how can VCCA best support these activities to increase climate change in health professions education? If I think, um, yeah, I can try <laughs> to answer it. I think um, it's it's kind of a combination of the two questions. The second question being how can students ensure the continuity of the efforts described today? Um, the I think part of it is um, we do need faculty sponsors for all of these things. And if there is a faculty sponsor, there who is willing to say like, yes, I will ensure that this continues to go forward. It um, makes the administration um, much more willing to kind of support us. So that was a big thing for the elective when I was reaching out is um, they needed a UVA faculty person who was going to continue teaching this and make sure it doesn't just kind of fizzle out after, you know, after we graduate and go to residency. Um, so I think continuing, because we as medical students, 
talk a lot amongst ourselves, but I think more having more intergenerational discussions and support um, is really what is going to be helpful and, and make sure that the knowledge and um, progress we've made continues on to, to later and earlier um, school years. A great question, Dr. Paulson, who is also one of my mentors at GW. So you know the answer <laughs> to this, but to the rest of the group, um, some feedback that we've gotten from our deans and faculty about using the learning objective approach is that that actually helps the element of longevity and sustainability in our curriculum. Because once the learning objectives are there, that's kind of the thread that, that stays as time goes on after we graduate. Um, so I guess it's kind of, the uphill battle of getting those learning objectives implemented at baseline and then kind of who's gonna review them over time, who's gonna assess the, like whether those competencies are being met. Um, but in my opinion, which is obviously limited because I don't work in medical education, um, from what I've heard, it sounds like once uh, an objective is there, it undergoes review um, periodically, but it, it becomes part of um, the other objectives that are like monitored by curriculum deans and faculty. So I think using that approach can be really helpful. And it sounds like we're all kind of working towards that in, in a lot of In terms of how VCCA can help, I think so far y'all have been doing great. Um, as has already been said, many of you are faculty members at our respective institutions. And um, in, in strengthening our network at, of VCCA, but then also understanding who in our, in our university communities are actually climate in, you know, oriented and aware, um, it's been really helpful just to see who, who's around. Um, for UVA, you know, Dr. Wise is now gonna be guiding the fourth year elective. And so that was crucial to uh, our efforts. Um, so keep it up mostly. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lena. And thank you all for um, taking the time to answer those questions. Um, there will be um, just one more moment if anyone has any final questions. Um, but other than that, uh, I just wanna thank everybody again for joining us for this webinar today. and. I think if there are no final questions, we will go ahead and um, close it out for the day. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thank well, just you. a reminder, you all will receive that email with the CME credit. So if you would like to get your CME credit for the webinar, please make sure um, to just check your email after it ends and wraps up. And I hope everyone has a great rest of your, your Thursday afternoon. Thank That's you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all. Are we sticking around? Or we're just gonna phone call, no.